Alright, buenos dias, mis amigos. Alright, so, I don't really know where I'm going today, uh, but that's every day, right? I'm just going to go wherever I go. So, I got this chart. I thought, you know, maybe if I made a visual, a chart, to sort of uh, give an idea, a vision of who is not saved in the world today. Now, if we made a list and started outing all these groups of people, I think we would we would narrow the number of actually saved people down to a very small number. And if we get a very small number, then that would be an indication that we are very close to the end. And that would be consistent with what we read in the Bible. In particular, uh, Matthew 24, when it says, Except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. In other words, if God let things play out the way they are, there would come a point to where there'd be nobody saved. And so, therefore, if Jesus is coming today, and there's no reason why he can't come today, then there has to be a very small number of people saved in the world today. Take a look at, in the days of Noah, there was only eight souls saved. Right? In the, in the time of, uh, in, the, in the days of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, in the cities around about, there was not even ten righteous within those cities, and they all got destroyed. And like what we read in, in Luke 18, where it says that he will avenge them speedily. That God will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, shall he find faith on the earth? That's a clear indication that there are not going to be that many people saved. And of course, in Matthew 7... Jesus says, you know, uh, beware of false prophets, right? But many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. All these people saying they believe in Jesus, but they are not saved because they think they're good people. They think that they are going to be saved because they're good. And of course, Jesus says, I am not come Here, let me let me find it. I am not come to for the righteous. I am not I am not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. See, Jesus has come for the lowly who need a Savior, and not for those, the high and mighty, who think they're doing good things and deserve heaven. Now, all those people that think they're good people and think they're good enough for heaven, they're all going to hell. All right, and of course in Matthew 24, you know it's incredible, really, when the disciples come to the Lord Jesus and ask him privately, saying, "Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world?" And the very first thing Jesus says is, "Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying that I, Jesus, am Christ." And shall deceive many. Many people will say that Jesus is the Christ and shall deceive many. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. See, we're on a downward spiral. 
spiral. You think about all these pastors and preachers that are at the head of all these churches in your community. Never mind my community, just think about the ones in your community. What if you found out that all these heads of churches, they all went to a Bible college, a seminary school, when they were a 19-year-old snot-nosed kid. And that's how they got their position of power. And what if you found out that this young 19-year-old pervert with snot coming out of his nose did so because he thought this would be an easy life to make easy money and to have control over people. It's a wonderful gig. Huh? And so they've been trained. They've been trained to parrot this and parrot that, echo this and echo that. And they don't have any understanding at all. But they have a, they have a, uh, you know, uh, a list that they go to, right? A script that they follow. All right, so when Jack says this, then you say that. When Jill says this, you say that. And they got a script that they follow. Everything they do is a script. Every sermon that they preach is already been written. And I, you know, I don't want to get into all that, just because I happen to. No, not that one. sermonaudio.com see they just follow whatever another man has already said they lack understanding every single one of them all right so i'm gonna i think i might I, the idea i had is to just make a list a visual list so something for you and me as well, of course, to think about that what if all, all these people on this list are not saved? All these people on this list claim to believe in Jesus, but none of them are saved. You know, you go, let's go to, real quickly, let's go to uh, oh goodness, I forget. Is it Matthew 6, Matthew 7, somewhere in the Bible, somewhere it says something to the effect that, Matthew 7, I should have known that. Uh, it says, let me find it here somewhere. Oh, I was, wasn't I there already? I was, but I, okay, who cares? It says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. What do you think this is talking about? This unsaved people? Okay, sure. But among the unsaved people, there are many people who say they believe in Jesus. And I, yesterday I did a, a Google search and it said, I think there was 2 billion people. Is that right? 2 billion Christians? Two point four billion. You, you think two point four billion Christians are in the world today? What is there? Seven billion people. So two out of every seven people you know is saved. You believe that? You you believe that? And then you read this. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord. And then Jesus will say, I never knew you. Of those 2.4 billion 
people that say that they are a Christian, obviously this includes Catholics and Mormons, of those 2.4 billion people, how many are actually saved? All right, so if you look, consider this, if you say not all 2.4 billion are saved, and then turn around and criticize me for this list, you are a hypocrite. Because I'm doing the same thing that you're doing. You're doing the same thing that I'm doing. All right, now, if you don't like my list, that's fine. I would like to see your list. All right, so in my list, the very first one I have is those that reject the Bible they hold in their hands. Think about how many of the 2.4 billion Christians in the world today don't believe the Bible that they hold in their hands. Right, well, if they even have a Bible. Well, it, that's another thing. But let's say they, imagine this, if you will. They have this Bible, and they don't believe it, but they believe it's a translation. How many would you say of the 2.4 billion Christians in the world today believe that? That's their view. That the, the Bible that they hold in their hands, it's a translation of the Word of God. I contend that it's nearly 2.4 billion people. And I contend that none of them are saved. Because... They do not believe the Bible that they hold in their hands. They do not believe the Word of God. All right, so think about that. The Bible that you hold in your hands, is that the Word of God, or is that a translation of the Word of God. Because if it's a translation of the Word of God, that supposes that there's another book. And that's the Word of God. And the book that you have is a translation of that book. Now, anytime somebody points to the Greek or the Hebrew, they are admitting that they don't believe the Bible that they hold in their hands. They're admitting that they don't believe God. They don't believe the Word of God. If they don't believe the Word of God, then they don't believe God. And if they don't believe God, how can they say, how can you say that they're saved? Now, Matthew 7 is a great chapter, isn't it? Because here we got, we got these, you've heard me probably uh, teach on this quite a bit. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, and the will of my Father is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Many will say unto me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out many devils, and cast out devils, and blah, 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 blah. Okay, and in thy name done many wonderful works. All right, so that's great, man. It's great there. And then, of course, um, the the one I was just talking about earlier, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in there at, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. Now, real quickly, let me go. 
find this verse. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, which sometime were disobedient when once the long-suffering God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. You notice something there? Wherein few, that number few, is eight. Matthew 7. Matthew 7 it says, And few there be that find it, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. Now you see the correlation there? First Peter 3, where in few, that is eight souls, were saved. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Right there. Verse 37. But as the, day, uh, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Right? And so here, in the days of Noah... We see wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved. And then in Matthew 7, straight as the gate narrows the way, which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. In Matthew 24, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. And remember... Again, except those days shall be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. All right. So, if that's true, and Jesus comes today, there can't be 2.4 billion Christians. There can't be 2.4 billion saved people. That's not few. Few? Few is eight people. Few is not 2.4 billion. Uh, if there were 2.4 billion saved people, Jesus ain't coming for a million years. At least. Uh, there'd be no reason to. It would be w evil if the Lord come. Because there's still an opportunity for so many people to get saved. There are so many save people to help lead the young generation to the Lord Jesus Christ. And with 2.4 billion people, it's just an incredible number. But if there's only eight people saved in the world today, then obviously it won't be too much longer when there will be zero people saved. So God's going to shorten those days right, for our sake. So you consider, Jesus says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. So therefore, 2.4 billion, that can't be right. That might be people claiming. But it's not the actual number of saved people. Now, again, here in Matthew 7, this is interesting. All right? In between those two things I pointed out, the not everyone that saith unto me, and then the Straight is the gate, narrow is the way. In between there, it says, Beware of false prophets. False prophets, false teachers, same thing. Which come to you in sheep's clothing. Now, you think about Reverend Schmitty at your local church. He dresses nice, smells nice. He's, he wears that expensive perfume or cologne or whatever you call it. 
Smells real good. Drives nice car. Wears nice fancy suit. And he's a nice guy. Super nice guy. Huh? Are you kidding me? He's one of the warmest gentlemen you'll ever meet. But inwardly, they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs or this of thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that brings not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Now this is interesting. Okay. So I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. Um, you can't know who's saved and who's not saved. You can know if you're saved. Yeah, once you're saved, there's no doubt about it. Once you are born of the Spirit of God, <laughs> silly Gatinas, huh? Uh, once you are born of the Spirit of God, there's no doubt about it. Okay, you know it. But you can't know if the person next to you is saved. You can hope they're saved, but you can't know they're saved. And so um, I was having this conversation with this gentleman and he said and I told him the same thing and he said well you should you'll know them by their fruits yeah yeah that's right you'll know them by their fruits and then of course <clears throat> excuse me <coughs> of course um, the fruit of the spirit is love patience and oh I better I better quote this all but the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace long suffering gentleness goodness faith meekness temperance against such <clears throat> there is no law right so the fruit of the spirit is it's a good thing right good stuff good stuff that doesn't mean that when you see somebody that is that full of love and joy and peace and gentle and goodness and all this, it doesn't mean they're saved. All this is saying is this is the fruit of the Spirit. It's given us a description of the fruit of the Spirit. It's not an indication of who's saved and who's not saved at all. So in Matthew 7, when we see, beware of false prophets, you shall know them by their fruits. And again, whereby, or wherefore, by their fruits, you shall know them. This is not talking about love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. It's talking about the opposite. You shall know them by their fruits. Not talking about saved people. It's talking about false prophets. All right. So, whenever somebody says uh, anything in regards to how do you know if somebody's saved, and they say, well, you'll know them by their fruits. No, that's not. This here, here. This is talking about false prophets, not saved people. All right. I mean, it's incredible to me, because uh, I've heard I heard that the other day, and I, I'm sure I've heard it before. Oh, you'll know them by the fruits. The, that's how you tell if somebody's saved. Are you kidding me? That's not in the Bible. Let's see right there, Matthew 7, Matthew 12, 
either make the good the tree good and okay so uh, that's kind of the same thing for every tree is known by his own fruit all right that are the fruit of the loins being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God so there's no mention I you know you could do a study on this on your own if you want I don't want to I'm wasting too much time. I have a tendency to to go off, right? So, my point is, you can't know who's saved. But, you can know who is not saved. Alright, and these people that reject the Bible they hold in their hands, not saved. All right, number two, those that reject eternal security, not saved. You hear people talk about once saved, always saved, how it's a doctrine of devils and evil and wickedness. I mean, the idea that, hey, you, you can get saved, be born of the Spirit of God, and then never lose your salvation, you're stuck, Chuck, forever and all eternity. Oh, goodness gracious how horrible is that well that's no good right well I'll tell you what it's what I believe and I'm pretty serious about that <laughs> I'm very serious about that I take this very very serious because if that's not true then Jesus Christ is a liar and that's easily proven with Scripture that we have eternal life and these guys that that uh, reject it they're obviously not saved and because they're not saved they're not gonna understand it people that are not saved don't understand the Word of God that's it's amazing it's a phenomenon really but I don't care how many degrees you have I don't care your IQ is in the 200s even higher you're not going to understand the Word of God period because there's the veil upon your heart that God puts there because you don't believe there's no way for you to understand in John chapter 3 verse 36 he that believes on the Son has everlasting life right now right now we have everlasting life it's ridiculous to say no why well, no you don't you'll, you'll have everlasting life in the future and that's that's stupid that's not what it's saying at all and then what's even more stupid is to say well you can have everlasting life right now but then you can lose it I mean that's as illogical as, as anything anybody could ever say there's no thought put into that at all. And now, if you have a hard time understanding English, I could probably excuse you. Everlasting life, though, in the English, means life that lasts forever. Right? <laughs> it's not eternal life if you could lose it. It's temporary life. It's ridiculousness. All right, so, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. You're sealed. Sealed, secure, sanctified, saved forever. Forever and ever and ever. And Jesus says, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Well, unless you lose your salvation, then you'll die. No, that's not what he says at all. That's ridiculous. But of course, people that are not saved are not going to be able to see it. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Whosoever drinks from the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. Here, let me see if I can find... Let me... Somewhere in the Bible, I think, says something. I'm 
pretty sure. There it is. Yeah. But whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. What? What? Unless you lose your salvation, then you'll get thirsty again. Is that? I, there's no logic to that. I don't care how you spin it. You can spin it however you want to satisfy your own delusion. That's okay. That's on you. That's not on me. This is very easy for me to understand. Because I am born of God. Whosoever drinks of the word of the water of the Spirit of God, whoever is born of the Spirit of God, whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Everlasting life is life that lasts forever. So if you drink of that water, you, you're you stuck. You're stuck, Chuck, and you can't get out. You're trapped. You're like It's like being thrown in prison and the prison guard throws away the key and moves to Mexico. You're stuck. How horrible is that? You're going to live forever. <laughs> Except you're not going to be in jail. You're going to be free. Right? And of course, um, Jesus says, If the Son shall make you free, If the Son therefore shall make you free, Ye shall be free in Indeed. All right, so we're going to be free. Now, we are free. We're free right now. Spiritually. Not physically. But in the life to come hereafter, we're going to have total freedom. We're not going to have dependence on another. And another person is not going to have dependence on us. We are going to be 100% free. But even now... Are we free? Jesus has freed us from the bonds of the law, the bonds of sin. We are free right now. And so, yeah, you can go out and, you know, commit all these sins and do all these dirty things and all this and that. Sure, but here's the problem is now, I mean, if you're born of God, if, if you're like me, you ought to know. You already know. You already know that the reason you called upon the name of the Lord is because you wanted out of that wickedness, away from that wickedness. All right, and so God pulls us out of that wickedness. So it's it, it goes against our spirit. It goes against our conscience to want to then being rescued from that. To then once again go back to that. It, it might be in our nature. It might be, you know, a, a, or we've kind of developed a habit and that sort of thing, a routine or whatever, you know, just a, a desire for these things. So it's a war against our own flesh. And that's what Paul talks about. But we want delivered out of that. And so that's why we came and called upon the name of the Lord. Right? So it doesn't make any sense that we would want to then go back and do all these filthy things. Right? Now we can, but there you know there's we're gonna pay the price for it. I mean not only might we get in trouble with the law if we were you know if we were doing things that were illegal. You know, and not only uh, we m might get in trouble with the law, get people mad at us, you know, all this, and if we're sinning, transgressing against others and all that. But our own conscience, our own spirit will be against us, and God will make us to recognize that, to know that. Hey, it's wrong. And yeah, we can't get around that. It's, it just doesn't make any sense. Even though once we are saved... We're going to have those same desires 
that we wanted saved from. Oh, wretched man that I am. Wretched man that I am. Who can save me? Who can who shall deliver me from this body, from the body of this death? Oh, wretched man that I am. All right, so we're all wretched. We all need a Savior. All of us. And just as Moses delivered his people out of the wickedness of of uh, Egypt, so also will the Lord Jesus Christ deliver us out of the wickedness of this world. All right, thanks be to God, we have a Savior, right? All right, number three, those that put their hope into a bonus one thousand years. It's incredible. It's incredible. Now, most of these people in number three also fall under one and two. Okay. Most all of them. But this idea of a bonus thousand years, it's, it's so delusional. And it's arguably the single most wicked thing being taught in the world today. And let me make that argument real quick. And that is because... What this suggests is that unsaved people can wait. And that's cruel. Absolutely as cruel as you could teach any unsaved person. Oh, just wait until the Lord Jesus comes. And then after you see him coming, and then he gives us uh, long extended lives, and you'll have a thousand years to then make that decision if you want to believe in him. See, I mean, you got plenty of time. No, no hurry. You can just wait. Wait until Jesus comes, and then the reality sets in that when Jesus comes, that they should have never waited because it's over. That's why all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Right? In uh, Revelation 1, Revelation 1 says that all kindreds of the earth shall wail. Right? They're not mourning and wailing because God's going to give them a bonus thousand years. They're mourning and wailing because they know it's the end of the world. And so you're going to, what are you telling them that they can wait? That when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, they're not going to be killed? They're not going to be judged. They're not going to die the second death. Is that what you're teaching? Because that's completely contrary to the word of God. And not just that, that's cruel. That's cruel to say, hey, kid, you just wait till Jesus comes and then you can believe in him. And then that kid is killed on the day of the Lord when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven why did you tell that child that he can wait when he can't wait today is the day of salvation you put it off till tomorrow tomorrow might be too late that's why people are mourning that's why people are wailing and that's why people are having heart attacks men's hearts failing them for fear it's because everybody's gonna know it's the end of the world. It is the great and terrible day of the Lord. Judgment day. Are you saved? Are you not saved? It's when the wheat is separated from the tares and the tares are burned up. And what are you teaching? Oh, you can just wait. And of course, oh, that's what Reverend Smitty said. Well, I'll just wait. Even though, you ought to know it, that you have no excuse here. Right? You have no excuse at all. The heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. 
The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. You're not surviving that, Jack. What in the world were you thinking? You're, you're teaching all these children that they can wait? What's the matter with you, man? That's the single most cruelest thing you could ever teach a child. It is. The elements shall melt with fervent heat in the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Why are you teaching people that they can wait? Because they can't. Why are you teaching this idea of a thousand year period? When it's not in the Bible at all. Well, I already know why. I already know why. And I, I'm not going to, I'm going to try to cut this off real short here, but just in case. You haven't heard me talk a thousand times about this. The reason they teach this idea of a thousand years after Jesus comes is because of their sexual fantasies. There is no other reason. And the Bible even makes that very clear, very easy to understand that this is the world that we live in. Where these men... <clears throat> With all the power and um, control over the churches and this and that, they all are perverts that teach this idea that there's going to be a thousand years after Jesus comes where they're going to be in their glorified bodies and they're going to be ruling over unsaved women and children. Now, not all of them like to talk about it, but anybody um, with a brain ought to be able to know that these guys are teaching this because they have a sexual fantasy of being in their 20-year-old body and having the same sexual energies that they had back then. They think they're going to have that in the future again. And that's clearly against the scripture. Here in Jude, even, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. They're a bunch of perverts. A bunch of perverts teaching this idea that there's going to be a thousand year period where they're going to be in their 20 year old body having all kinds of stinky sex. All right, so I, that's, I think, enough of that. All right. I think it's time to wrap it up. Okay, so. This idea of a thousand year bonus thousand years, it, it's not in the Bible at all. Revelation 20, it, it, I don't know how in the world you read Revelation 20. Honest to God, how do you read Revelation 20 and imagine that there's a thousand year reign of Jesus? It doesn't say Jesus reigns a thousand years. It says quite the opposite, quite the contrary. It says they, meaning us that are born of God. We live and reign with Christ. It doesn't say Christ reigns a thousand years. Well, you've got to be delusional. And of course, again, it goes back to if you're not saved, you're not going to see it. You're not going to understand it. Period. The veil is upon your heart. And it's impossible for you to understand it. And of course, I've, been all, uh, <laughs> I've talked about that a million times as well. Right. Even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. This is all throughout the Bible. Right? Even goes back to, uh, you probably heard, maybe I ought to put that on a list. I'll give that some thought. This idea that Satan is a god. Satan is not a god. There's never any mention in the Bible of this idea that Satan's a god. Satan is not the god of this world. It's not a, that's not in the Bible, all right? So in Isaiah 6 and Matthew 5, um, make the heart of this people fat, make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed, right? And of course, 
Uh, what is that? Oh my goodness. And I shall heal them. Oh no. Oh no. I just I should just go to Matthew 5. Doesn't matter. Who cares? And I will. And I should heal them. Okay. Matthew 13. I th what did I say? Matthew 5? I think I did, didn't I? No, Matthew 13. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, and lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted. And I should heal them. Again, this is all throughout the Bible. That if you don't believe, you're not going to understand. Right? Just like, uh, you know, I think in my mind, uh, anyways, that uh, the Pharaoh... It's a great example of that. When God hardened the heart of Pharaoh, right? He, so he couldn't understand. He couldn't know what was going on, right? And so also, those people that are not saved today, they can't know what's going on because they don't believe. And they don't deserve to know what's going on. Uh, this is overwhelming. Okay. Uh, I also will choose their delusions. Okay. So, hold on, buddy. So, so, uh, come on now. Alright, so, uh, in uh, Exodus 19. Thank you. Okay. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Now, who said that? Was that Satan? Satan said that? No, it wasn't Satan. It was the Lord. I don't know how you missed that. I really don't. That's the Lord saying, all oh, the earth is mine. And then you, you want to give it to Satan? That you're breaking... You're break, you know this was Exodus 19, right? You know that in Exodus 20 is the Ten Commandments when we read thou the very first commandment I, I don't know how you miss this honestly God how do you miss this thou shalt have no other gods before me well yeah but Satan's a God wow you just broke the first commandment come on man you just broke the first commandment by saying Satan is a God thou shalt have no other gods before me Except for, well, Satan. Satan, you, that's okay. No, it's not okay. Uh, wow. I mean, you believe one God, thou doest well. Oh, what happened? Doest? Doeth. Aha. Uh -huh. Doest. Thou believest the one, thou, thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Well, wait a second. Is that one God, Satan? The devils, who do they believe in? Satan? So that one God, and they believe in Satan, and they believe in, or they tremble? No, 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 no. By your standard, well, that, that should be capitalized. As if somehow the capitalization of the word God means something entirely opposite. No, it doesn't. It, there's no example of that in the English language where the capitalization means something 
opposite of what it would mean if it wasn't capitalized. All right, <clears throat> so here in, in 2 Corinthians 4, uh, verse 4, in whom the God of this world uh, should be capitalized, it doesn't matter because there's still only one God, whether that's capitalized or not. It should be capitalized. I'll agree with you if you say it should be capitalized. Where I will disagree wholeheartedly is that somehow, because it's not capitalized, well, well that means Satan. Well, what no, oh my goodness sakes. I don't think that's the first time I've done that either. Goodness gracious. All right, so 2 Corinthians 4, you notice here, if you go back to 1611, you know that they got it right. All right so let's see if I can hone in and, and just sort of, here, I might have to do it this way. Just so that I want you to be able to see this. I want you to lay your eyes on this and it's maxed out right there go down to verse 4 and whom you see my cursor here I'll put it right in the middle of the screen and whom the God that's a capital G I don't know why and it doesn't even matter whether it's capital or not it doesn't change the meaning of the scripture all right well, should that be capitalized? No. If it was capitalized, would it change? No, it wouldn't change. It doesn't matter. Because the evidence is overwhelming that it is God that hardens the hearts of them that do not believe. It's overwhelming. All right. So I'm not sure what how I got on this rant. Uh, oh, I was gonna. Maybe I'll put that on the list. I'll consider that. I should wrap it up now. I, I think I've gone over my 15-minute limit. All right, and I want I want to keep it down to about 15 minutes. I don't want to ramble on too long, but I think I want just a little hair beyond 15 minutes. All right. So if you have any ideas, if you have disagreements, I want to hear them. All right, let's let's help one another. Let's sharpen one another, and uh, let's talk about it. I mean. Is there anything more important than the truth?